Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 25th day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Okay, yeah. Um, I think today I'll talk about barbecuing the sacred cow. I'm starting with Mike, Mike Bickle. Oh, my. It, it's interesting the kind of comments you get when you go after the sacred cow. You know, what happened to... Uh, uh, who was that? Gideon, when he cut down the idol. Was it his uncle that said that uh, Baal can defend himself? <laughs> Something like that. I can't I think it's the idol of Baal. It doesn't matter. Ba by the way, Baal simply means the Lord. So all these people saying, the Lord told me this. What Lord? The Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord Baal? Uh, when it comes to the charismatic movement, that's a good, good, good question. What Lord are they actually worshiping? Are they worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, or are they worshiping Mike Bickle in a particular case? Or uh, what's that guy from California, Bill Johnson? Or, you know, how about some of the dead idols like uh, William Branham? Uh, there's there's whole cults that still exist uh, based around William Branham. And you can see pictures, and it's a, a photograph of him like with a halo over his head. Well, as a person who has been a photog or hobby photographer for a long, long, long time, let me tell you what that is. It's either a light in the building or it's a lens flare or a combination of both. It's not the Spirit of God. If it was the Spirit of God, it'd be like the angel with the axe ready to take his head off because he was one of the... Balaam. False prophet. False prophet. Denied the Trinity. See, if you have people that deny essential core doctrines of Scripture... And, by the way, it wasn't the Holy Spirit that told, gave him his messages. It was an angel named Emma, if I recall. And Branham is still cited by all kinds of people that don't even know who they're citing. They don't even realize that some of the things they say comes from that character. And uh, Paul Kane, who was one of the Kansas City prophets the one who died of alcohol and who was a homosexual. Uh, he, uh, he was com uh, connected with Branham. One of the things that uh, you run into among in the charismatic movement, especially in the in the fringe elements. Now, the prophets and apostles, they go way back. That was just a resurfacing of the latter day rain stuff that was back in the uh, 40s, I think it was, and, the, and then uh, the uh, Assemblies of God. And it was mainly in Canada. Uh, and the Assemblies of God put a kibosh on it. But it didn't stay dead, it came back from the dead. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, and I, I had somebody gave made a comment like when I I, ref, I talked about my one of the episodes I had, well with the uh, with the spirit the, the 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 demonic spirit that yelled at me, at the uh, missionary school. That the the impart the imparted spirit, so. I, I'm going to assume the the spirit that he was giving to the others there was the one that yelled at me because. It didn't want me to, to try to figure out what it was. <laughs> yeah. I, see, these demons are not the smartest things on the block, I'll tell you that, uh, because they usually, when they do that, they reveal themselves. Uh, another incident, see, th there is a spiritual world out there. I mean, I'm, I'm not one of these dead Christians that don't believe in anything. Uh, no, and, and I'm, let me say right up front, in some ways, the charismatic movement in particular— the Pentecostals, they were wrong side of the track kind of thing. They were backwater fringe, uh, just like 
you know, like the snake handlers and something like that um, in the Appalachians, which are still around, even if it is illegal. <laughs> and the, the ones that, that, that will bear your sin for you and all kinds of strange cults exist in this country that are, that are not even fringe Christianity, but they'll claim to be. It's like the Mormons. They're, they claim to be Christians. La Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They have nothing to, to do with the real Jesus Christ. It's absolutely nothing. They're much more strongly connected with the Masons. In fact, their temple rituals were a ripoff of Masonic rituals. Well, who do the Masons worship? Not the God of the Bible. A generic deity... All right, but actually the charismatic movement did bring uh, in to many dead churches a living faith. It's not because of the speaking in tongues. It's not because of the so-called born-again experience at all. Uh, in their case, it would have been, uh, or the, the, the second work of grace would have been the first work of grace probably. But what it, what it, di what it does, and I was thinking about this, and, and I'm— I think you know, I, like an engineer. I I want. I've always wanted to understand things. So now I've got a lot, a lot of work to do. But uh, th there is a positive effect because, like like a, a typical Protestant, I would say, or even at evangelical, they pray, but they don't expect an answer. They don't really expect God to answer. They hope God might answer. Um, but they don't expect it. I, I, you know, it's like um, in the church I was grew up in, sort of. We moved around a lot, but it was like the home church. It was where I was baptized as an infant, and where I went through confirmation, and and the, and the bishop came and laid hands on me and said, "Receive the Holy Spirit." It's like I thought you got that when you were born again. Their theology screwed up which was when you were sprinkled. No, apparently you don't. <laughs> it's, it's like, okay, just for fun. Actually, I ran, ran across a verse one yesterday that sort of supported the pre-trib rapture, but I forgot what it was. You have to look at the testimony of all of Scripture. You, you can pick a verse out that will support almost anything if you put a spin on it. Take it out of context. But uh, Where was I going to go with that now? Oh yeah, uh, the, the the Lutheran the, the the women they had a a prayer chain. You know, you cut you, you somebody wants a prayer and it goes from phone to phone to phone. It's like the grapevine, uh, the gossip network at churches. Um, let me say too, because if people mention gossip, gossip is something a sin that's done maliciously. You're spreading a, a malicious tale about someone in order to destroy them. Uh, it's not done in love. There is there is uh, communication of problems that are done in love, and others that are done in sin. It's not the same thing. Uh, if you care about people and you're you're just you what are doing it in a constructive way, communicating some things is not sinful, but it's wise is being done. Why is it being done? Is it being done for Christ and for the church, or is it being done just maliciously? People don't understand that. They just see the word gossip, and they use it as a club. Like, touch not the Lord's anointed. Where is that in the New Testament, people? And who spoke that, and in what context? It was David. It was David said that he would not touch the Lord's anointed because he would not touch King Saul. He would not kill King Saul when the opportunity arose because he was, God had appointed him king. Hardly relevant to the church. Uh, but the, 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 the kickback from some people, it's like uh, when I recounted that uh, incident when the, where the demon yelled at me, it's like, well, that's only your personal perception. Has it been verified? <laughs> the, 
That's my personal testimony. It is my witness account. What's a witness? What, what would you do in court? A witness is telling what they know, what they experienced, what they saw, or they think they saw. Their personal perception, that's what it is. To the testimony of two or three witnesses. So if you can find three witnesses out there that say Bill, or what's his name, is a, a Mike Bickle is a false prophet, well, then I'm better to receive it. No, it has to be uh, eyewitnesses. I, this whole deal, I'm not, I don't know anything about the actual details. Only what's uh, publicly available on the internet. And there are statements out there. Again, there's a, a published statement by the three individuals that are acting sort of like intermediaries. And the reason they're doing that is to protect the women against a very powerful man and a very powerful institution that is utterly dependent on that man. Uh, he's the idol. He is the vicar of Christ in IHOP. The Pope of IHOP. And, and that's the problem with those kind of institutions, those churches that a man built rather than God. It's not like a typical, I'm all in favor of small churches, I think. How can you know, you know, how can you have a fellowship with a thousand people? Uh, they're just, personally, I think house churches are probably the most practical, but they certainly are the cheapest. You don't waste money on building expense and all that other stuff. Let me tell you what the Amish do. I'm not endorsing their doctrine 100%, but uh, the Amish don't build church buildings. They'll build a, a school building, for which serves a purpose. But the Amish... They don't have church buildings. They do not have chapels or anything like that. What they do is they worship in houses. They actually construct their houses with this in mind. They'll have like uh, removable dividers and everything else, so they can they can open up the house for church, and it rotates. So it's not a burden on one family, for example. And then they have like um, wagons that contain all the chairs and the it, it, it's a long worship service and includes a meal apparently so they'll have like uh, all the things they need for that in a, a wagon and it just they just move that so you have the the chairs and the the eating uh, utensils and all the the stuff that's needed for it and so maybe for one month it'll be at one person's house and then they only do this every other week, by the way. In between the assembly of the particular assembly you're with, you're expected to go to some other neighboring church and gather with them. I approve their practice, these these particular practices. And again, that they don't have buildings. Once you, once a church has to own property. There's a lot of entanglements, including legal entanglements and perhaps a need for a corporation, which is a creature of the state, and uh, legal requirements. And, you're, and This is probably the, the Amish. One of the things that some of their strange things, um, a lot of it's tradition, but there's a reason for the traditions too. They want to keep themselves free from being unequally yoked with the world. So they're not very consistent about things, but they have cell phones, but they don't allow a, they, they never used to allow a phone in the house. They could allow a phone in the barn. So these were like rulings, the different, they have their own individual set of laws called ord ordnung, the, the ordinances of the community. So they're not identical. But anyway, the, the idea of, of not having a fixed building, and they don't have paid clergy either. So it's one of the 
They actually select their their preachers by lot. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best. That's not biblical. That is not biblical, but they do that. Uh, so they don't have clergy, per se. I don't think I want to use the lot method. <laughs> Unless you have two very qualified people. And the the apostles did that, too. Who'd, who's going to replace... Um, uh, Judas Iscariot, and they drew lots from those who were qualified because they'd been with the uh, the ministry of Jesus from the beginning, and you know, so they were eyewitnesses of all these events. So they selected someone else, and then God selected Paul. <laughs> But what I want to start with here, well, I was going to say that the, some of the kickback I got is like, you know, you've just you've just touched the idol. <laughs> you've just touched the idol and their idol. And because of that, they go crazy. Now, it's not just charismatics or these are beyond charismatics. This is third wave stuff. Beyond the third wave, beyond Wimber and people acting like donkeys and eagles and bears and stuff this is which is very very similar to voodoo and native american religion at being possessed that's animism where you're seeking to be possessed by spirits of an eagle and it's like oh japers wimber was foolish foolish he was he was a really bad pastor uh he was not leading the, the his people in the right way at all he was misleading them not, I'm not saying he's doing it, doing it deliberately. He was just, oh, I remembered what he was, Quaker. He was a Quaker. Probably an evangelical Quaker, though. But still, the, the Quakerisms, the, the, the direct guidance, the inner light, ugh, it's got to be the Holy Spirit is our inner light, but it is, he always speaks consistent with his word. So if it's new revelation... It's not from God. And if somebody can, claims to be a prophet, it's not from God either. Because we don't need any more revelation. We don't. We have Christ in us. And, and God works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. But that's always consistent with his written word. See, the, 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 the scripture is the... Uh, the litmus test, or the uh, the proof of the message. So, if you get if somebody stands up and speaks what is utterly consistent with the scripture, there's not a problem with that. You don't have to have special gifts for that anyway. But if even even with the scripture, if somebody specifically says this is what the Lord is saying. Or this is this is uh, uh, you know referencing taking something in the scripture and applying it to a particular circumstance. Even then, does the Holy Spirit really bear witness with it or not? The Holy Spirit will will give you a if you actually belong to Him. That's the problem. So you can get into these this current kind of stuff. You don't have to be saved to get into that at all. What was it? The NAR under uh, C. Peter Wagner. I remember when that was much more of a accessible thing, shall we say, before they started to hide themselves because they were getting a little bit of flack or a lot of flack. Uh, C. Peter Wagner was never, quote, baptized in the Holy Spirit, by the way. He never uh, spoke in tongues. He, he, just, he just saw like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to jump on this thing. And he did. He just appointed himself the chief apostle. Just, just, just appointed himself. He's like, like Donald Trump, you know? Uh, they're just, just, I'm the guy. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the kickback I've gotten on some of this stuff, it, it proves what I suspected of this, this idolatry of leadership. And it doesn't occur only in the charis or, or only in these movements, the, uh, the Pentecostal, charismatic, third wave, whatever, apostles and prophets movement. It, which is the final 
destructive stage, really. It occurs also in any kind of these man-centered ministries. By man-centered, I mean centered on a person, a particular man. John MacArthur, he is like that. He is the, the untouchable holy cow out there in L.A., and he's surrounded by body uh, by people that function as bodyguards to maintain his reputation. Uh, he is the without MacArthur, Grace Community Church. What what would it be? Just another big box church, you know. Uh, he's built a ministry around himself. It, he is the brand. And if you don't believe me, just go to the go to the the website. Uh, look at his books there that he didn't write, by the way, according to inside testimony. That was people that were there a long time said, "No, MacArthur didn't write this stuff. He, he has his staff write it, and his, uh, his his staff, and then they get a stipend, and he gets the royalties. They just put his name on it. It's MacArthur. He's the brand. John MacArthur is the brand. And he's built a whole kingdom around that. They were even." <laughs> This is this, this. Here's an example that he himself spoke about at one time. I think it was on the radio. I heard this that apparently they had some little cube, uh, semi uh, solid state, um, audible playback device, and it's self powered and everything. Apparently, you know, lithium batteries, so it lasts a long time. And they were distributing these, they could be dropped and, or whatever, into some of the, uh, the air, back water areas of Vietnam uh, among the, some of the people that the American military was using back there, the, the Hmong or something like that. I can't remember exactly the name. They're not the standard Japanese or, sort of, or Vietnamese, but a sort of remote tribal communities. And so they they had this thing, and they were going to put the no something like that something like this is brilliant idea, a usable simple technology that you don't have to know anything about technology, but it it produces a uh, it's an audio playback device, and so you can have messages on there. Well, what do they fill the cubes with? John MacArthur's messages translated into that language. John John MacArthur's messages are not. The gospel. Very seldom does John MacArthur actually preach the gospel. He may preach the Bible mixed with an awful lot of John MacArthur, making a lot of statements that you cannot verify because they're just coming out of John MacArthur. Uh, connections. A lot of preachers do that. They they when they exposit the scripture, it's a whole lot of expositing in themselves. Like right now, I'm not exposing the scriptures. I'm just this is this is YouTube. This is not church context either. Uh, but this this is uh, so you have this one individual that is the center. Billy Graham, same thing. Billy Graham, uh, you know, touch Billy Graham, and you're like, nah. That's was he a good preacher? No, no. I I remember uh, actually analyzing some of his sermons when I was a new preacher. I was was listening to Billy Graham, and I but I. It's it's easier to do this too if you if you look at a transcript, but that wasn't available then. Like nowadays, there's usually a transcript on YouTube. You can so you can read the thing. Reading it is better than listening to it because you can think more objectively about what's being said. Uh, when you're listening to it, there's a whole different communication that's based on the environment and the crowd, and there's a whole no different dynamic at work there that isn't necessarily the words. And his messages were often confused and had nothing to do with Jesus Christ specifically, and he'd be talking about all kinds of things, and, and he'd interject uh, something like, turn to Christ, and then he'd go on and turn to Christ, and it's like, that's not preaching the gospel. You didn't hear about Christ and the cross and what Jesus Christ accomplished. That's very seldom something you hear. Um, most places, in fact, it's not really Christ and Christ crucified, which is, Paul said, we preach Christ and Christ crucified. Uh, to, the, to the Jews, a scandal, and to the, the Greeks, or the, uh, a foolishness. But to those who are being saved, 
He's the wisdom and the power of God. But so much of church, of preaching in churches is not about that. And I confess I did a lot. I followed what everybody else was doing too. All kinds of stuff. Not enough Christ and Christ crucified. Not enough. Of course, So there, a point I was trying to make with Billy Graham and MacArthur, it's not just people like Mike Bickle. Uh, you have these others where you've got leader worship, Jimmy Swagger, uh, uh, Jim Baker, all these followers, dedicated followers. It's like uh, MacArthur on the, the Internet. You'll have people out there, they're MacArthur fanboys. I guess that would be a... The actual biblical name would be disciples, but same thing, uh, mostly. And if you say anything about MacArthur, any kind of criticism or anything, it's like, bam! You touch their idol. You touch the idol. They can't tolerate that because their faith is built on the idol. And that's the problem with that. Um, they, they, are, they look to the idol as their God or their vicar, the the one whom through God speaks. And that is really prevalent in the prophets and apostles movement. I saw that thing rise. Again, I was involved in that uh, movement and on the edge, you know, the charismatic movement. Not, not, I could never get fully into it because of the scripture. And the fact I was born again, and God, Christ did dwell in me. He had, he had only let it go so far. And then I'd be like, Scripture's coming to mind. Eh, that, nope, that's not right, that's not right. But again, it started out mild, and it had certain beneficial effects, like a living faith, an expectant faith. Uh, and then... People take things like that to extremes, like Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagan and the Word of Faith movement and all that stuff, which is simply catering to the flesh. It has nothing to do with, with God. It is it is simply a a uh, a system of sorcery, attempting to get your will done, which sor which is what sorcery is. Sorcery is trying to use supernatural means, whether it's demons, angels, or God, to get your will done. I want this, so I'm going to use a supernatural formula, uh, incantation or, or magic or positive confession, which is, which is thoroughly occultic and present in those things in order to get, you know, it's me speaking the, in my words become reality. And these people like Copeland and others in that movement do not realize they're just saying the same things the occultists and witches have said for centuries. Yes, there are real witches. There was a coven of them around Madison, Wisconsin. Used to live up in southern Wisconsin. So, yeah, there was a coven of witches. There are things like that. There are people that worship the devil. I mean, really worship the devil. Not this, this phony stuff that is basically just people playing games down on the Mexican border. There were people, there were human sacrifices that were done on a regular basis down there uh, by the drug cartels, the, the gangs. They would sacrifice human beings to Satan in order to secure his protection as far as getting across the border and smuggling their stuff into the, the United States. I met a person who had seen one that was involved in some of that stuff. He had become a Christian, but he had seen a human sacrifice. There was a lot of things that happened in the United States, and especially in the border, that never, ever, ever are reported in the media. A lot of things the police know about Nobody wants it reported. It doesn't look good for the community. 
other things besides that kind of stuff, too. Things that are going on in the community that, well, it's in no one's interest. It's not in the interest of the mayor or the city or anything to have that known. Because of money. It's not good for their reputations either. It's amazing how much is not reported. Just talk to a police officer t- sometimes. You get in, get in a conversation. I found out some things that I would never have believed. Where the center of of drugs and everything else was. It wasn't where I thought it was. Hmm. Anyway, uh, Mike Bickle, and this isn't, I don't want to be specific about Bickle and this particular event. It's not important. Other than when people get exalted into an ex- or exalt themselves into a high position, the flesh is on restraint. And it almost always goes bad. I mean, if things go in a bad direction. Uh, abusing people, it, it creates an attitude of superiority. And it is so contrary to, to Jesus Christ at all. I mean, the man who washed his disciples' feet, and he did that, said, as a lesson, people don't even understand what he did. It's, but there, uh, and a, a lot of these people have not been born again. And that's why they do it, too, because all they are is flesh, and they are running on that power, and it is the, uh, the, the, the spirit that is working in the sons of disobedience that, that you, you might hear tr- uh, knowledge and prophecies that sometimes reveal secrets. Well, that's because it's coming from a demonic source through the flesh. And it's in Satan's interest to deceive Christians and move them away from Christ and Christ crucified into pursuing this garbage that Satan offers through his ministers. And the New Testament has a lot to say about these ministers. <clears throat> what does Jesus Christ say about himself? This is John chapter 10, starting at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling. And does not care for the sheep, about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That is what a true pastor is supposed to be. One who will lay down his life for the sheep. He is not... He doesn't put himself first. He does not exalt himself. It's like John the Baptist said, he, Christ, must increase and I must decrease. Because John the Baptist's uh, ministry was the one who prepared the way for Christ. Once Christ came, his ministry was coming to an end. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That was the culmination of his ministry. To announce and to point to the promised one. That's the ministry of every Christian preacher. To point to Christ, his master. To serve him. And to serve the congregation by pointing to Christ. But if he points to himself, if he exalts himself, he's a false teacher and a false prophet. These people that exalt themselves and build a ministry around themselves, they're false teachers. It's not about Christ, even 
in certain other cases, well-known preachers, that the ministry is all around that person and their name. That is not right. The shepherd, or some of the other translations, I believe, says traditional, uh, someplace, oh, New American Standard, lays down his life for the sheep. That's the one I was thinking of. Lays down his life for the sheep. So, for example, if the pastor um, scandalized himself, what does he do? He doesn't try to hold on to his position. If he's become disqualified, he leaves. Quietly lays down and leaves. For the good of the church, he leaves. Sometimes if there's a conflict arises and uh, he has to look at that and say, what's in the best interest of Christ in the church? Is it in the best interest that I stay and fight this out? Or is it in the best interest that, that I simply leave? And I'm not talking about a, an issue of sin, just a, a conflict. What is in the best interest of Christ in the church? That's where, that must be where the priorities are, not his personal interest. Just like when a, a preacher goes someplace to a church, is what is motivating him? Is it love of Christ and love of the church, or is it the love of himself and his own situation, his own income? Is he willing, is he seeking the same things the world seeks? Or is he willing to suffer for the name of Christ? It's like a missionary, missionary. And I had a conflict at the school because the guy that was teaching it, he had been a missionary a long time, and he was, uh, oh, down in, he had been in Mexico, and he, he was recommending that, uh, say, if we were down in Mexico, that we would hire servants to do the cooking and the laundry and everything else. And to me, that was very offensive because, as Paul said, I become all things to all men, that I by, may by all means, by all means, win some. So you go there, you don't bring your standard of living and your expectations. You have to be willing to live like those people live. And they don't have hired servants. You have to adopt their lifestyle, at least their exterior lifestyle, and live at their level. And if you're not willing to do that, don't go. Because you're not coming in the name of Jesus. Jesus laid down his life. He humbled himself. Though he was equal with God, he did not regard that as something to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, the form of man, to save sinners. And Paul said, let this mind be in you also, the mind of Christ, the willingness to lay down your life. If you can't do that, you can't be his servant. That's what the foot washing was all about. Are you willing to do the job of the most menial servant, the man at the bottom of the totem pole? Or are you too good for that? Now, in contrast to the spirit of Christ, you have the spirit of the apostles and prophets that exalt themselves above all, including the Word of God. And they come along saying, I have a message from God. Listen to me. They often sell it. I can remember where back in the day where you could buy a uh, cassette tape Direct with personal prophecies directed to you. 
I can't remember how much they were charging. It was like $50 or $100 or something like that. For personal properties, prophecies from a prophet of God. About you personally. Selling the word of God. Hmm. Uh, did, did anybody say anything about that? No. Because the people in this movement are so scripturally ignorant that they cannot recognize a fraud when they see one. They are so, without the gift of discernment of spirits, they can't recognize a demon when it's right in their face. They just think, oh, it's supernatural. I, something happened. I can't explain it. Oh, it was God. How do you know that? Uh, Bill, what's his name's church out there in Redding, California? Crazy Bill's church. What does he do? He, uh, he takes a Bible and uses the prop on his podium. That's a church with the plastic gold glitter coming down from the air system. Oh, it's the Holy Spirit. Look at gold dust. Yeah. <clears throat> really. So the Holy Spirit has to use fake gold. See, these people are cons, too. It's cons. Th these people exalt themselves and enrich themselves at the expense of the souls of those who hear them. They don't care they're sending you to hell as long as it puts money in their pockets. They exalt themselves. The, the, you could buy the title of apostle from the NAR back when it was Begin, back when you, they actually had lists online of who was a, an apostle or prophet. You could buy that. I think it was like 200 or 250 bucks. You'd buy it. Talk about simony. Buying the office of an apostle for a, for a couple hundred bucks. Becoming a member of the NAR. Oh, there was no such. But Michael Brown is an in your face liar because he knows very well what C. Peter Wagner had uh, set up, or Peter C. Wagner, whatever it is, had set up. And he was part of that group. And said, so, oh, there was no such thing as the NAR. It doesn't exist. Well, it might not exist currently as an official organization, but it did. And the the thing, the idea is still there. See, person might come across as a very mild, reasonable person. But in fact, they're covering for all kinds of scoundrels. I mean, I look at Michael Brown, and, and I don't want to even think that about him. But when I hear him saying, well, the NAR, that's just a mythical thing, you know, it's sort of like QAnon or whatever, those kind of ideas. I'm not quoting from him. I'm just, you know. But the idea, he was covering for that, and he knows very well what it was and who was in it and who started it. And see Peter Wagner, he appoints himself the head apostle he was not even a charismatic. Why did he do that? Saw an opportunity and grabbed it. That's what he did. But these people exalt themselves over the sheep and take the place of Christ. Turn you away from what Jesus Christ himself spoke and his apostles to their words. And the Internet is full of people like that. All these young people, these young women, young men, and older men, on the Internet. How many apostles and prophets are on the Internet, on YouTube right now, prophesying everything under the sun? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? Or who's going to be the next president of the United States? 
They'll, they'll prophesy that even though every, last time every one of them got it wrong. Donald Trump is going to serve a second term. God promises it. Speaking in the name of the Lord, I prophesy, I decree. Like they can decree anything. Only God can decree things. This whole word of faith thing is sorcery. Don't, but you're, you don't know it. You're ignorant. And the devil knows you're ignorant. There was a time, was this back in the 1980s, when the New Age was really hot, the New Age movement. And there was New Age festivals and everything else. That was shortly after there was Christian festivals. wonder why somebody tried to imitate that. And I remember going to Madison, Wisconsin several times because they had an occult bookstore there. And I wanted to know firsthand what these things were being, what, what was being taught. Not from some other person saying this is what's taught. I wanted to know myself. And I found out. So I like to, I like to go back to the original sources and find out what really has been said because I found often... People willfully distort things. So like some of the attacks on Andy Stanley. Now, in particular times, and I don't want to, I don't know Andy Stanley well enough to defend him uh, in total. But some of the things that Stanley's done, a person, a Christian could do that out of a good heart, and out of serving the Lord. There's a difference between wisdom and foolishness, but you can be foolish out of love and wise out of love. Uh, but if you're trying to reach certain people, you know, there's people that are, have a ministry to the LGBTQ community, like... Um, Mrs. But, uh, what was it, Butterfield? I was going to say Butterworth, no, Butterfield. Um, who was at one time a lesbian. Now she's married to a uh, Reformed or Presbyterian preacher. Saved. She has a rad rather radical open house ministry. Uh, a What used to be called... Uh, basically befriending uh, uh, friendship evangelism. In other words, you make friends with somebody, and then you, out of that relationship, uh, hopefully, if, especially with people that are hard, hardened to the gospel, um, it's difficult, let me put it that way, because it often doesn't work. Uh, it's not our deal, but it, it gets you into a relationship where people will trust you enough, maybe, to share the gospel with them, and you have some credibility. Uh, I don't think the Scripture teaches that, but that doesn't mean God can't use that. The, the Scripture teaches, you know, it's like debates. The Bible doesn't tell us to debate with unbelievers. It tells us to proclaim the gospel. If they believe it, they believe it. If they don't, they don't. If they don't believe it, leave them alone. Let them go their own way. Uh, that's what Paul did, but he didn't go necessarily preaching in the bars and brothels either. <laughs> he went to places where he expected people that already had some drawing toward God, places of prayer, for example. In other words, people that the Holy Spirit was already at work in figured they're probably more likely to respond than those that were at the the gladiator events or something. And I agree with that because I've tried, you know, some ways and thinking, well, just because some people need to hear the gospel doesn't mean they're willing to hear it. Uh, but yeah, but the, the, the prophets, so the, 
again, as I've said before, when the charismatic movement first started, it had some beneficial effects, uh, more so than the Pentecostal movement, because the Pentecostal movement was, well, it was started in the holiness movement. That was already going way in the wrong direction, but it was already among people that were Christians, so supposedly at least. <laughs> The charismatic movement, when when it jumped over, and uh, Dennis Bennett out there, was it 1960, in uh, California, uh, Anglican priest, when he received the gift of speaking in tongues, <clears throat> what it did in those spiritually dead mainline denominations, like Anglicanism, spiritually dead for the most part. There were some evangelical Anglicans, and there still are but really was spiritually dead. It, it had a beneficial effect because it spread. It, it created the excitement, and people came to a living faith in the, in the sense they expected God to actually do things, which is good. It's, you, you cannot pray in faith if you don't expect God to answer the prayer. And if you're not praying according to the will of God, though, God's not going to answer the prayer, so... First of all, you have to make sure it is according to the will of God. Uh, but that's, uh, you know. And God will lead us. because God is at work in us, both to will and to, to his good pleasure. So sometimes we'll find ourselves praying in unexpected ways. God's leading us. Christianity is supernatural. It's just that it's been infected with a lot of false prophets and false apostles. These pe the very idea that these people would exalt themselves like this, and again, you could purchase recognition as a prophet or apostle from the NAR once upon a time for a couple hundred bucks. Join the organization. Be recognized as an apostle. Bought and paid for. By who? Are you bought and paid for? <clears throat> well, you bought yourself into something that uh, doesn't come from God. And that's the real problem with people like Bickle, uh, the Kansas City prophets. I can remember when that was a big thing. And people, you know, if you don't, it takes a while before the fruit starts to, the tree starts to bear fruit. So at first, you know, is this of God or not? It's just like the experience I had with the demon yelling at me at the school. It was, I, I was there with an open mind. I was there, is this really of God? I didn't know. But once the demon yelled at me, I knew exactly what it was. It was not of God. That was not the spirit that revealed Christ and Christ crucified for my sins. That was the Holy Spirit. This was something else. Yeah, the the supernatural world is real, but what do we? How do we deal with it? We have to be. When you're dealing with supernatural things, you have to be constrained by God's word, other because you're, we are so easily deceived. We do not have eyes that see the spiritual world. We do not have ears that hear the spiritual world. We are created for this physical environment. We don't have the senses to directly perceive those things. So we're, just, we're totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we don't control the Holy Spirit. He's not at our beck and call. He there's, he's there to serve Christ and serve God and God's purposes and we're dependent on his, his leading us and the Word of God. If we're not, uh, the, the Scriptures, if we're not willing to, to abide within the Scriptures and looking for, for uh, the Word of God somewhere else, we are fair game for Satan. We are on the lunch menu, and he will devour you. And if you think you're a prophet or apostle and what comes out of your mouth is the Word of God, even when it has nothing to do with what God has said, well, he's already devoured you. 
internet is full of young people. Thus saith the Lord. And they're prophesying falsely. Because if they're prophesying anything that is not already stated in the scriptures, they are prophesying falsely. The faith once delivered, once for all delivered unto the saints. If we feel like we have to go beyond that. So why do they do this? The flesh. Why do these people, there was a young, there was a young man, probably still on there doing it, named Black. Why was he prophesying all kinds of things? Just one, one of many, many, many. Why do they do this? The flesh. The flesh. Exalting themselves. They want the attention. They want people to look to them. Not to Christ. Look to them. I am the voice of God. Satan's deceived them. And their flesh responds to Satan and the, 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 they work together because your flesh wants to exalt yourself because that's what it is. It's flesh, it's self. And Satan comes along and says, you're so wonderful. You are God's favorite. You are God's apostle or prophet. And the flesh goes, really? I'm so wonderful. God chose me to be his voice. You realize history is full of people like this? Joseph Smith, the one who gave birth to the Mormons. He was a scoundrel filled with flesh. And Satan said, that's my boy right there. He's been scamming people with his treasure scheme. I'll just give him a new religion to scam with. This is nothing new. It's been going on since the time of Christ. Tertullian, famous Christian, Latin, uh, Western Christian, was taken in by a couple false prophetesses. He believed them and the guy that was sort of their pimp. How do I know they were false? Because they prophesied Jesus would return at a certain date. Way back then, he didn't come. They were false prophetesses. See, when a prophet prophesies something and it does not come to pass, the Scripture says, do not fear them. They're not God's prophet. But does anybody in the movement today believe the Word of God? No, they don't. They say, oh, Michael Brown, oh, that test doesn't apply today. Prophets can err. In fact, you'll hear these people say the Holy Spirit sometimes deceives his own prophets. They are so deluded by Satan, they believe these kind of lies, that the Holy Spirit sometimes lies. God can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie, because God is truth. can't lie. They are so far removed from God that they believe God can lie to them. Why do they do that? Because they prophesied falsely, and rather than say, I prophesied falsely, they blame God. They blame God rather than themselves. What does that? The flesh. The flesh. All the way back in the garden. God comes to Adam. What did you do? Did you eat of that tree I told you not to eat of? As if God didn't know. See, this is, this is the parent confronting the child for its disobedience when the parent knows exactly what happened. What did you do? Oh, that woman that you gave me she deceived me. She gave me the fruit. She did it. It's her fault and yours. You gave her to me. And she gave me the fruit. And I didn't eat. It's not my fault. It's yours and hers. And then he gets to Eve. 
What does Eve say? Uh, it was a serpent. It was a serpent. It wasn't me. The flesh. The flesh. It still does the same thing today. Blames others. Little child. Two boys. He did it. They probably both did it. But he did it. The other says, no, he did it. Why? The flesh. The flesh. And we see this, so when somebody sins, especially when they built an entire cult around themselves, who are they going to blame? The accusers. Sick the lawyers on them. Threaten them with slander lawsuits, something like that. That's what they do. Silence the problem. Silence the problem. Another famous church, not Pentecostal or charismatic or prophetic. There's a very sound report that a young lady was going to school there. And there was another person pretending to be a student that was hanging around campus. And uh, he got her to go with him to a party and, uh, and uh, laced her soda with, what is it, lohypnol, the date rape drug. And then over a period of several days, he kept her drugged and raped her repeatedly. And then once he ditched her and she came to herself, she went to the office of the head of this institution and uh, reported it to him and trusting him. And his response was, uh, you drank alcohol? Well, he, yeah, he apparently dragged me to a bar and gave me a drink of alcohol. Well, that's forbidden. You're expelled. You were, you were doing things that are contrary to school policy. You're gone. So who was, who was, what kind of a shepherd was this person that did that, the head of this institution, that did not care for what happened to the young lady who was a student at school? Did, was, was he serving the Lord Jesus Christ? Or was he protecting his own backside from scandal? I think that answer is pretty clear. That's what happens. It's a flash. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, the sheep of the Lord Jesus. He does not sexually assault them. And if he would do such a heinous sin, he would, how could you even abide under the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Could not. Could not. The very thought of that would be, knowing the flesh can do things like that, it's not that it can't happen, but the very thought of, of doing something like that is like, uh, how could you endure? Pretend it didn't happen? You would be living in torment. And then to, to dare to do such things is say, thus saith the Lord. This has happened over and over and over and over again. Brothers and sisters, all these public scandals, it's just like the Roman Catholics. Why can't they realize there's something wrong with that institution? Scandals after scandals after scandals for decades and decades and decades. The problem is that institution. The prophets and apostles movement. All these scandals that have come up. 
Yes, and there has been more there. Just look. Just go on the Internet and search for scandals in the church. Something like that. You'll find all kinds of lists. And just look at those and say, hmm, they're not all charismatics. Not all prophets and apostles. But most of them are. Most of them are. There's a reason for that. It's because these people are always big names with ministries built around themselves. Not, I shouldn't say always, typically, typically. They are the center, not Christ. And that leads to this, because they are that, the very thing that they exalt themselves as the center and build a ministry around them is of the flesh. Any true ministry must be built around Christ. And those building that ministry should be careful to diminish themselves, to build Christ, to build around him, and make sure that they aren't the center. You understand? A good shepherd lays down his life, doesn't exalt himself. Christians, as John the Baptist, we always should be of that mind that is puts aside ourselves for the interests of Christ. Just like, just like Christ laid aside the prerogatives of his equality with the Father, the glory in order to take on the form of a servant, of a man, in order to save sinners. This is the spirit, the mind, that ought to be in us. Not the attitude of the flesh that seeks its own, seeks itself and what benefits it. And if you are going to be a servant of Christ in a ministry, deacon or pastor or missionary, anything, you must have that attitude or you will be a failure. Oh, you might gather a following around you, but if you gather a following around you, you are a failure. It is only those who can look and see the following, the, 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 the people that are following Christ. That is a measure of your success. Not those who follow you. May we all have that mind.